On that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever enter the assembly of God. For they did not meet the people of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. Yet our God turned the curse into a blessing. As soon as the people heard the law, they separated from Israel all those of foreign descent. Now before this, Eliashib the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God, and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they had previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil, which were given by commandment to the Levites, singers, and gatekeepers, and the contributions for the priests. While this was taking place, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I went to the king. And after some time I asked leave of the king and came to Jerusalem. And then I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah, preparing for him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And I was very angry. And I threw all the household furniture of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I gave orders and they cleansed the chambers. Then I brought back these vessels of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. I also found out that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. So I confronted the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine and oil into the storehouses. And I appointed as treasurers over the storehouses, Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and Pediah of the Levites, and as their assistant, Hanan the son of Zachur, son of Mataniah, for they were considered reliable and their duty was to distribute to their brothers. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. Thus I cleansed from them everything foreign, and I established the duties of the priests and Levites each in his work, and I provided for the wood offering at appointed times, and for the first fruits. Remember me, O my God, for good. But it is good to be with you. The sun is shining. It is great to be in church. And today, as Nat said, we are at week 14 of a 14 week series. And on the last Sunday of every series, all of God's people lament together. Oh. Have no fear. The Bible's a big book. There is more Bible to come in the weeks ahead. But today we are going to close the book of Nehemiah. Uh, before we get there, I uh, wanted to add my voice to Nat's encouragements. Uh, you hear us say a lot, we're a church about knowing Jesus and making Jesus known. If we were to double click in on those first two words, to know Jesus, it's not just about being introduced to him, but rather making all of our lives all about him. And so the goal of our church, the goal of our ministry is to help you make all of your life about Jesus, to be knowing Jesus in every sphere of your life. And so uh, as Nat said, I want to encourage you to get along, whether it's this afternoon, to the Gospel Groundworks course, which is a course to help you do exactly that, to apply the Gospel to every part of your life, not just here for the next 80 minutes together. Uh, please come along to that. would love to have you there but also as well, next weekend is the Single-Minded Conference, and Sam Albury is going to be uh, teaching the implications, again, of what difference Jesus makes for us when we think about the fact that He has given us bodies, and yet our bodies belong to Him. And so, if that is something that might be 
interest of you, uh, please do head along to the office next Saturday uh, for the Single-Minded Conference. If you've been thinking about it, let me encourage you to commit to that, and you can head to our uh, events page for more detail about that, or you can grab Steph Hill, who often leads us in worship. She's going to be in the foyer uh, at the end of the service. You can chat to her as well. Anyway, we're going to pray before we get into the text. Let's pray together. God Almighty, we thank you so much for your word, and we thank you your word is a story. And you have been telling us a story through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah in the last 14 weeks. Lord, we pray that that story would intersect, would resonate, would overwhelm our own story, that we might find ourselves in what you are doing in the world. And so we pray that today you might help us close the, the chapter or the book, uh, but not close its impact to our lives and the ways that you are directing us. And so come and speak. Holy Spirit, we uh, have nothing in it of ourselves to conjure up the ways that we need to change because of Ezra and Nehemiah. We need you to do it in us. And so bless us now uh, in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, as we land the plane today on uh, our Rebuild series, we're going to land it very uh, simply with one big idea. Just one big idea. I've mentioned before that I love a good podcast. Who's, who's a pod, any podcasters in, in the house? Uh, you guys probably know all the podcasts I'm on. I'm often late to the game, but there are a couple of genres of podcasts that I listen to. Naturally, because of my line of work, one of those genres is, is ministry leadership. Uh, there's a whole uh, kind of ecosystem out there of trying to train up pastors and, and Christian leaders to think well about it. And then another genre I'm into that's a bit more left field, not related to my work, true crime. I hope not related to my work, but true crime type of uh, podcast. And so you can imagine that uh, perhaps some of the most engrossing podcasts for me and that tells you something really must have gone wrong is when ministry leadership podcasts come out in the true crime genre, uh, like true crime. And uh, the world has has been looking, or or our little bubble of the world, has been... uh, focused for some year now on a podcast called The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, which is a little bit like the combination of ministry leadership and true crime. But it does tell the epic story uh, that we, uh, in our kind of section of Christendom in the Reformed evangelical world, had a front row seat to see over the last 20 years or so. If you don't know, Mars Hill was a church in the US that that had a meteoric rise in its public attention and growth uh, from the late 90s to the early 2010s. And all that growth was built around the the, the vision of, of an kind of authentic church, of authentic people engaging with the Bible authentically, living out the gospel authentically, instead of being what people had kind of gotten used to, this kind of large, programmatic, vanilla, impersonal, impersonal megachurch machine. Mars Hill was something different, and it was indeed. I uh, was able to connect with some of the leaders when Mars Hill was up and, and running, and always found them to be remarkably generous and faithful, uh, and was blessed by them. They were involved in uh, starting the Acts 29 network that we, City on a Hill, find ourselves being a part of. Uh, and throughout this time, people were coming to know Jesus. Lives were being changed. Churches were being planted. The church grew to be a church of some 15,000 people. Its own podcast downloaded millions and millions of times. It was incredibly influential. And then it all fell apart quicker than it rose. The church and its pastor, Mark Driscoll, were involved in a series of, of controversies and failures in relatively quick succession, all of which undermined that vision that it had initially begun with. And so it led to the split of the church, the resignation of the pastor, the the dissolution or dissolving of all of its ministry. And the podcast dissects this all, and it leaves you thinking, what a waste. What if so much gospel potential yet wasted due to the lack of character and humility and the distraction of success and celebrity. And it raises a question for for the listeners. It raises the question for people like you and me, because that's just one story of many that perhaps we could recount that we know about of failure. It raises the question, how are we going to respond to failure? How How do Christians handle it 
when people that we looked up to or things that we trusted in, yes, we loved the rise, but can we handle the fall? And in the podcast, we hear about the incredibly damaging effects of the fall. Thousands of people now deconstructing their experience, hurt by the breakdown of trust, coming to grips with uh, a ministry and a, a leader who was so polished on the outside, yet broken within Some have walked away, others have moved on, still others can't seem to process it all. It is devastating. But tragically, because of our own human experience, and perhaps especially because of our Christian experience, we need to be people that learn how to respond to failure. Leaders are going to fail. Movements are are going to fail. Churches are going to fail. Christians are going to fail. And in our Rebuild series that we have been looking at, haven't we been tracking for 13 weeks of the 14-week series, this, this remarkable rise and return of God's people to God's place, rebuilding God's city. Just recently, we've seen that great trajectory that the Bible was opened before them, and God's people read it, and they were cut to the heart, and they were repentant, And they were convicted and they resolved together to change and transform. Revival had come. This was one of the high points, especially the high point of, of their particular generation, where they all gathered together and they covenanted before God. We're never going to go back. We are going to be different. We're a people set apart for God. And then last week we saw they they rejoiced at the restoration of, of God's city as the wall had been built. It was now complete. And so life could could go on in in a state of sanctified bliss because they'd reached the pinnacle. Revival was here. God's people were on the mountaintop. But after that remarkable rise that we have invested 13 weeks of our lives into, of tracking and learning the, the hows, what can we learn from Nehemiah? What can we learn from God's people here? What to do, what not to do? After that remarkable rise, what we're going to see today is the seeds that were in God's people that led to their judgment and being sent to Babylon in exile. Yes, you can bring them back to Jerusalem, but you can't take the heart out of God's people. They're still, their rejection and their rebellion is there and they fall back into idolatry and faithlessness quicker than they rose. And so we're going to read of their failure today. Nehemiah is not, does not have a happy ending. We're going to read about how Nehemiah himself responds to their failure, and hopefully through it. Uh, the one big idea we're going to look at today is that it gives us this opportunity, this chance to think about how we're going to respond when we ourselves fail and when those around us fail. If you walk with Jesus, you are going to fail. And so how are we going to handle that? Let's talk it through. We're going to walk through uh, the whole chapter, some of which wasn't on the Bible reading. So if you do have your Bibles, whether in paper form or screen form, it would be good because I'm going to lead us uh, to parts yet read to us. Let's first talk about the rise and fall of the rebuild, the rise and fall of the rebuild, because we read of this remarkable failure. There are four things particularly that, that Nehemiah or the author wants us to see as failure on behalf of God's people and happens in in kind of quick succession. First, we read the people uh, at the beginning of the chapter, obviously listening to the Bible be read out, and they must be listening to Deuteronomy, particularly chapter 23, because they hear in this chapter that the Ammonites and the Moabites should not be kind of co-mingling with them. They shouldn't be gathering with them together as one people, lest the the Ammonites and Moabites infect or, or kind of move, influence God's people toward idolatry. But look at what happened in in verse 4. Now before this, Eliashib, the priest, who was appointed over the chambers of the house of our God and who was related to Tobiah, prepared for Tobiah a large chamber where they'd previously put the grain offering, the frankincense, the vessels, and the tithes of grain, wine, and oil. And so here's the high priest, the, the, the religious leader of God's people at the time, and he's got Tobiah. And if you've been tracking with us throughout the series, you might remember that Tobiah is, is the most prominent Ammonite throughout the story, the, one of God's uh, 
like opponents to Nehemiah and God's people who famously got in the way. Well, not only does the high priest of God's people welcome him into the temple, in fact, he goes to the linen closet and pulls out the spare linen for him and he throws everything else out of one of the rooms and he makes a bedroom for Tobiah the Ammonite so that he can live in the temple chambers. And then it gets worse. In verse 10, it says, I also found out that the portions of of the Levites had not been given to them, so that the Levites and the singers who did the work had fled each to his field. And so at the time, the the ministry workers were the Levites, and they were called to be set apart to minister amongst God's people, and God's people would provide for them so that they could be set apart, and yet here evidently those people have forgotten the people who were meant to be at the heart of worship of God, of Israel, have neglected them. And the Levites have had to go farm for themselves and make their own ends meet. Thirdly, in verse 15, In those days I saw in Judah people treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of grain and loading them on donkeys and also wine, grapes, figs and all kinds of loads which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. You see, God loved His people so much that He actually wanted the rhythm of their weeks to give time through the Sabbath to remember that it's the Lord that provides for them. And yet here they are, Nehemiah sees them working on the Sabbath, trading on the Sabbath, buying and selling on the Sabbath. Now, if all of this together isn't bad enough, it gets worse right at the end. There is one final insult to all that Ezra and Nehemiah have been working hard at for the last 13 weeks for us, but a generation for them The people are intermarrying with the nations around them again. But they're doing so now, or have done so now, to the point that the children are growing up and they don't even know the language of God's people. They speak foreign languages. And as icing on the cake of the kick to the stomach of Nehemiah, we read in verse 28, And one of the sons of Jehoiada, the son of Eliashib the high priest, was the son-in-law of Sanballat the Horonite, Therefore, I chased him from me. And so the grandson of the high priest, one of the elites, one of the leaders of God's people at this point, has married the daughter of Israel's most recent and most provocative and most destructive enemy, Sanballat. And so the country's gone crazy. A remarkable rise, a remarkable revival And yet in one chapter, it is all coming down, crashing. And the author lays it out like this in these kind of four different things that have gone wrong because we're meant to remember what we read when we were in Nehemiah 10 where God's people got all kind of G'd up and they they came together and they resolved not to do these four things, not to intermarry, not to commit idolatry, to to be faithful and and pure around the temple. And just three chapters later, here they are, in moral compromise, social compromise, spiritual compromise. And so we come to Nehemiah 13, and all we read has sucked the life out of what we've been building for the last 13 weeks. It shows us that you can rebuild the city all right, but it is much harder to rebuild the moral fabric of a community. You can build a church, but it is much harder to to build people to be the kind of people that we, the church, are called to be. And so it shines a light here on the fickleness of our human resolve, on the fickleness of our sense of conviction in the moment. Because in Nehemiah 10, God's people had had their come to Jesus moment. God's people had sat there and they listened to God's word be spoken out over them and they'd bowed their heads and they'd closed their eyes and, and they'd all raised their hand and they'd come down the front of the aisle. The word had struck them to the heart. This was now going to be different. This was their line in the sand moment. And so they prayed a prayer. They met with the pastor after the service. They filled out a form. They entered into the discipleship program. They were not going back. They were never going to backslide again. This was it, and here they are now. And we could look at them and think, man, how ridiculous. 
that they can't even keep their commitments that we read just, just three chapters ago. And we could think that, but we need to stop and consider how you and I actually do exactly the same thing. I do it most nights of the week when it comes to chocolate. You know, I, I down a slab of Cadbury fruit and nut, and then you think at the end of the slab, man, I went through that quickly. This is going to be terrible for me. I, I, I can never do this again. I will not do this again. I'm going on a health, health kick. Before you go to bed, you kind of Google what's the best diet, and then the next night, you're opening the pantry to find out what is there again. But it's not about our taste buds. It's about our spiritual lives. Because don't we, we repent with sincerity and with conviction. We resolve to never be that person that we were in our moment of weakness. And then perhaps even just minutes later, hours later, when the mood has changed and we've woken up the next day, we are back to our old self-centered worst. You and I and God's people in this story, their physical return to Jerusalem was great. But they need a hope that goes beyond their own sense of moral self-improvement. And just like them, you and I, we can be brought to conviction each and every Sunday. We can have those stirring aha moments as we're opening the Bible with our gospel community. We can resolve to be different, to, to come to church, to make church a bigger part of our life, to get more Christian friends in our life, to speak to us, to be plugged in and put ourselves physically in an environment that we know is going to shape us and change us physically. And we should indeed do all of those things. But the main lesson here isn't to avoid failure because we're all trying to do that anyway. But this chapter holds a mirror up to us and tells us, no, you will fail. You will fail. You won't keep your promises. You won't hold your strength of resolve. You will breach your own standards, let alone God's. Sometimes you're going to be a very disappointing spouse. Sometimes you're going to be a very disappointing friend. Sometimes you're going to be a half-hearted worshipper. You're going to be a sinner. And this book reminds us that nothing in and of ourselves is going to bring change and nothing in and of ourselves is strong enough to be our final hope. You are going to fail. That's our first thought. It's a super optimistic message, isn't it? Welcome, welcome to church, everybody. You are going to fail. But it is important to recognize because often we come, don't we, and we think about all the ways that we're going to change, all the ways that we need to be better. But let's, before we do that, consider the inevitability of our failure. This side of eternity, we're never going to be the people that we commit and resolve to be. And so let's continue. The hope is coming. Let's talk about the complexity of Nehemiah, because not only are we going to look at the people and their failure, we need to look at Nehemiah, the leader, and his response. Many years ago, I got introduced to a uh, way of doing Bible reading and, and devotional reading, where you kind of end your Bible reading time by writing out your prayer based on what you just read. And you can imagine then that if you really want to know me, reading what I'm praying would probably be a really clear indicator of what is going on in my heart and in my mind. And we get the sense as we read Nehemiah 13 that the Nehemiah has, has let us in on his prayer journal here as he's processing these events. Because after hearing about the, the compromise with Tobiah, we read in, in verse 14, remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for his service. And then after rebuking the people who had ignored uh, the Sabbath, he says in verse 22, remember this also in my favor, O oh my God, and spare me according to the greatness of your steadfast love. And the last line of the whole book of Nehemiah, remember me, O oh my God, for my good. And so we see that in the midst of a city and a nation of, of compromise, Nehemiah keeps his eyes and his heart trending toward God. He is dependent upon God. And he's done this throughout. The book started with Nehemiah coming humbly before God, asking for his favor, his help, before he would come humbly before the king, that he might restore God's city. 
And so Nehemiah comes across a little bit like Tom Cruise in the new Top Gun movie. Great movie, by the way. But you know, there's no real character arc with him. There's no ebbs and flows. He's just always the hero. He's just, there's no failure in him. He is the hero. And Nehemiah has been remarkably successful to this point. He is, through his own strength of conviction and vision, he has led God's people all this way into revival. And here he is trying to chastise them and, and bring them back onto the straight and narrow here in Nehemiah 13. But in Nehemiah 13, we see that Nehemiah is not all a hero. That there is a shadow side to his strength and his leadership. Because in between the prayers that he prays here, and this is the complexity of Nehemiah, between the prayers that he prays, we see that he, he takes the work of God into his own hands. And he shows a harsh and a dominant spirit to the point that in his response to other people's failure, in his response to the people's sin, he himself doesn't remain gracious. But we see in verse 25, he writes, And I confronted them and cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. Later on, he chases away those who make him angry. And so, yes, Nehemiah's vision and his drive is super impressive to begin with. But now it looks like he's driving something in the flesh that can only be accomplished by the Spirit. And so the leader himself ends up falling like the followers around him. And it highlights one of the ways that we are particularly prone to fail. We are particularly prone to fail when it comes to our response to failure. You know, I see it in myself that if I fail... I fail in my responsibility to my wife and my family. Maybe I, I speak harshly. Maybe I waste time. Maybe I emotionally check out. And I get exposed as having failed. You know, the immediate response in me is self-pity. Self-pity to find all the reasons for why I'm the victim in this situation. All the reasons for why the problem is actually out there and it was imposed upon me and forced me to fail. But if others fail, if it's other people out there that fails, particularly people that might get in my way or make my life inconvenient, something my heart doesn't always immediately try to find the reasons why external forces might have been imposing upon them. Now, instead of pity in that moment, it's self-righteousness. We're prone to harden our hearts, to condemn, to judge and write people off. And so in both directions, we, we typically respond in ways that are self protective. And so like Nehemiah, we lash out. But the Bible calls us to a different way. And when it comes to responding to Jesus, or responding to failure, we can look to Jesus. How many times should we forgive those who sin against us, Lord? Seven times? What does Jesus say? No, Peter. Make that seven times seventy. The implication of what Jesus just says there is that, hey, people are going to fail a lot. You're going to have to get used to dealing with the people around you, disappointing you, sinning against you, to the point that you're going to have to forgive them again and again and again and again. And as he tells us that, 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 that all of us uh, are going to fail, he then gives us another part of the Scriptures, a direction to focus on in the midst of failure, that we shouldn't rather be focusing on the speck in that person's eye when they do, but rather the giant log that's protruding from our own eye because of our own failure. We have in the Gospels a lot of data about how Jesus responded to people that the culture around him said were failures, and indeed before God's holy law were failures. There's a story in, in John 8 uh, where a woman who's been caught in adultery is brought before the religious leaders, the, the Pharisees, and they're picking up stones to condemn her according to the law. But she's brought, or Jesus is there in their midst. And he says, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And then he turns to the woman. And he says, go and sin no more. And so Jesus has this remarkable ability to, yes, acknowledge failure, but respond with amazing grace. He's, he's honest. And he's humble. He's strong and he's servant hearted. And here Nehemiah thought it was all about the strength of his leadership 
to the point that he showed no strength at all because plucking out beards is the weak way to go when we have a God who we can rely on and depend upon. Trusting in human strength is not going to be effective, whether it's our own sin or others, in bringing about change. No, we can't change the heart. And so we're going to fail if we respond to failure in our own strength. And that leads to the very final lesson or the sub-lesson of our big idea. Let's talk about our only hope for renewal. Because the crux of all that we see here at the end of this failed renewal project amongst God's people. The very first people of God failed. Adam and Eve, they failed. Ever since Adam and Eve, the people of God have failed again and again and again and again. You and me likewise. We sin, we'll disappoint, we'll sometimes be half-hearted and other times be wholehearted about the wrong things. We'll fail to love the Lord, our God, with all of our strength. We'll fail to be as passionate in prayer as we know we should, as obedient as in relationships as we might, as holy as we're called to be. And after all that these people have seen and been through, the failure of the people in this case shows that they didn't ultimately need a renewed city. They didn't need a renewed social rhythm. They didn't need to just be transported from from Babylon back into Jerusalem. No, they needed a new heart. They needed a new heart. And so the big lesson of Ezra and Nehemiah that we should be left with at the end of our 14-week journey is that real spiritual renewal doesn't come in bricks or in buildings or in bold leadership, but in a new heart that can only come from the Spirit of God Himself. Thankfully, the same God who's behind all these events in in Ezra, Nehemiah, is a God who holds out his hands to us and, and, and offers us a new heart. He offers us a hope that, that he is, he's honest and he gets down onto our level. And he tells us, it's true. You're going to fail. Indeed, you have failed. Indeed, everybody of us have sinned before him and therefore with our hearts continue to sin before him and each other. But he wants to come and give us a new heart. And Nehemiah could have known this because uh, as the exile was uh, being kind of executed upon them there in the 6th century BC, before Nehemiah's time. The prophet Jeremiah was writing to God's people to give them some hope in the midst of them being shipped out to exile. And he wanted to call them to the future, to a day where God would give them, indeed, new hearts. In Jeremiah 31, he says that God says, I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. No longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I'll forgive their iniquity and I'll remember their sin no more. And so the only way that we can bear our own failure is to have a heart that knows that we don't measure up, but that God will measure up for us. Because even with our new hearts, and if you are trusting in Jesus, the reason that you trust in Jesus is because God gave you a new heart to trust in Jesus. This side of eternity, we're still going to fail. And so our new hearts tell us that at the bottom of it all, our faith cannot be in our own faithfulness. Our strength cannot be found in the strength and the intensity of our resolve. Our trust should not be in our own trustworthiness. There is only one hope that is never going to fail us. There is only one person who is never going to fail. Our faith, our trust, our strength, our only hope is in God doing what only God can do for us. And so at the bottom of it all, at the bottom of Ezra and Nehemiah, at the bottom of every story of Scripture, at the bottom of the story of Scripture, the only hope we have is Jesus. The only hope we have is Jesus. See, what's unique about this new heart that God promises us is not that we won't fail with it, we will, but that even when we do, we'll still have faith in Jesus. 
we'll still have the work of Jesus for us. All we have is Him. And so if you're here and you're kind of been exploring, maybe you came with a friend, you've kind of been exploring this Christianity thing, this, this Jesus message thing, what, what's it all about? If you are not a Christian, just notice this, that, that we are gathered here today as Christians, not because we see ourselves as, as special people, not as, because we see ourselves as, as any kind of better or improved people, not because we're here to celebrate our own religiosity. No, in fact, it's the opposite. We gather here because we know we've failed. We gather here because we know we need help from outside of us. We gather here because we know we need resources that we can't be found within us. And the solution that the Bible offers us is not that we might come here and get a shot in the arm and then go and live better lives. Not that we might improve ourselves or become more spiritual or religious, but that we solely rely on Jesus. Christians rely on Jesus. Christians follow Jesus. One of my favorite stories of Jesus is one that he tells of two men who walk into a temple to pray. One of them's a religious elite. One of them has all the the outward righteousness going in his direction, a Pharisee. And the other is the opposite, a tax collector looked down upon and indeed hasn't followed God for his life, despised by the Jews and known for his immorality. And they both walk into the temple to pray and the Pharisee starts to pray and says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I thank you that I'm particularly not like that guy over there in the back corner. And then the tax collector, we hear what he's praying. He's praying, well, he's not praying actually, he's beating his breast, beating his chest, not lifting up his eyes to heaven. And all he says is, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus concludes, I tell you this, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And Jesus tells that story. And it's a great lesson to us. It's not merely a lesson for how to become a Christian. It's also a lesson of how to be a Christian, how to live as a Christian. Because Jesus is our only hope. And at every single step of the way, every day when we wake up with our disappointment and our half-heartedness, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus is our only hope. And as we've titled this series, Rebuild, and we've kind of seen how this resonance between what happened back then and what we're trying to do now in, in building a church, building a people who follow God, who trust in Jesus, who live out the gospel in our spheres, in our neighborhoods and in our networks. We need to see at the end of Nehemiah 13, in their failure, that as we try to build a movement for God, Jesus is our only hope. As we try to live ourselves for God, Jesus is our only hope. And so it's a fitting week today to finish this book by celebrating communion together. Because communion reminds us that we need something outside of us to be us. We need something outside of us to to do what we're called to do. We need something outside of us to rely on, to trust in, to find our strength from. And the meal of communion that Christians have shared for the last 2,000 years reminds us of Jesus, of his life lived, of his death died for us. And so we're going to come now to a moment of communion. We're going to gather around the, the body and blood of Christ. And as we come, we don't come trusting in our own righteousness as if we've earned this. No, we come purely to receive it, to receive like grace, the gift from God for us. And so we're going to partake in, in bread uh, and in juice. Uh, and as we do, the promise of the scriptures is that, that Christ is going to dwell with us spiritually. That Christ is going to give us mysteriously a, a, a sense of spiritual strength as he blesses us through this meal. And that means that this is a a family meal for those who are trusting in Jesus. Uh, And today we're going to do a little bit different. We're we're going to rewind the clock. No longer are we going to have little kind of everything involved and peeling the really loud stick of things. Rather, we're going to get out of our seats to come down and receive communion today. The bread's been pre-cut. It's okay. No one will handle it. It's all right. We're all here. Uh, We're going to receive communion today. 
And so if you are trusting in Jesus, you are welcome to come and receive. If, if you want to trust in Jesus today, you are welcome to come and receive. But if not, let me encourage you to remain seated and just consider what it might mean for you to join with these people who aren't relying on themselves, don't have a great resume to fall back on. And if we did, we wouldn't want to anyway because Jesus is better and Jesus is our only hope. So I'm going to pray for us and then I'm going to introduce the elements to us. Let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you for the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And Lord, we grieve at the resonance that we find with Nehemiah 13. Because as we have seen ourselves in your people, as they've found hope in bringing, being brought back to your presence, being brought back to your city, so we also see ourselves in them as they fail to keep their commitments, as they reject and forget the ways that they have resolved to love and serve and live for you. And Lord, we repent ourselves for the ways that that is so natural in us, that to err is to be human. Lord, that failure is so a part of who we are. Sin is so a part of who we are. And Lord, we repent of that. And we ask, Lord, that you might come and help us, therefore, rely not on ourselves, not on our own sense of self-improvement or strength, Lord, that you might help us rely solely on Jesus. We thank you for your cross that we come to remember in this moment of communion, that you laid down your life, that you laid down your body for us, giving it up. You laid down and poured out your blood for us to cover our sin. And so we fall upon you in this moment. We lean back upon you. And we thank you now for these gifts of this bread and juice. Lord, we pray that those of us who eat and drink of it might be renewed by you, be partakers by faith of your body and your blood. And so renew us by your Holy Spirit. Unite us as your people, the body of your Son. Bring us into the joy of your eternal kingdom where we won't be defined anymore by the ways that we have failed, but rather by what you've done for us in Jesus. May that be true for us today through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.